Pentecost, the fourth of seven major Jewish feasts, is the only Jewish feast with a countdown. And with me today, Bob Ulrich. Hi, Bob. How are you? It's great to be with you today, Gary. And Bob, we've got a, a very pleasant subject to talk about today. In fact, we're going to talk about Pentecost, which is my favorite of all the Jewish festivals. And it comes into the New Testament. I, I, I think everybody's heard about Pentecost in the New Testament. It's a wonderful feast, which has a numerical countdown, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But the beautiful part of Pentecost, Bob, is the, the promise that's associated with it. It's the promise of something new, something exciting, something different, a new phase. In the case of the church at Pentecost, it brought a whole new uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a marvelous holiday. You know, Pentecost is one of the seven Jewish feast days. Now, why are Christians talking about the Jewish feast days? What's the significance of each of these days? And we really hope today that we can really zero in on this one feast day, the Feast of Pentecost. It's got several different names in the Hebrew and the Greek, and you're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're the name of our program is the Prophecy Watchers. We're watching prophecy. Sure. And there is absolutely a prophecy of high significance that revolves around Pentecost. And for us, every day is a countdown. Uh, we are watching. We are waiting. Uh, we believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some people even disagree with that idea, saying that no, He can't come until certain things have happened. We don't believe that. We believe that, that everything that needs to have been fulfilled has already been fulfilled. We're just waiting His coming. Can I read a quick story? Sure. This is really fascinating to me because, you know, why do we do what we do? Why are we here talking about Pentecost? Uh, I've got a copy of a little book here called Rest. Of course, you and I don't have any time to rest. We're always on the move. You know, but there's a story in this book about a king and the king shows up in town with this huge entourage with hundreds of shovels. And they tell the people, everyone gathers in front of the stage, and he says, I'm going to collect a great treasure. And when I return, it's my desire to give it freely to the citizens of the country. Mm -hmm. All you've got to do is take a shovel and dig a hole on your property. Well, you can imagine the reaction of some of the people, and I'm not going to read through all the accounts here, but you've got the enthusiastic people, you've got the doubters, the scoffers. Ah, where's your great king? When is he coming back with his great treasure? You know, and it reminds me of this verse in Revelation, you know, chapter 22. It says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. Now, the idea here was that the king said, you dig a, 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 as big a hole as you want, and I'll fill it with treasure when I come back. And, of course, as the story goes, some people said, eh, you know, that's not really going to happen. And some people said, I'm not even going to dig a hole. Others started, and they never finished. Exactly. And, and it's a great sort of a parable. It's a, it's a great parable, and, of course, it has an application for us today, because here we sit looking at the words of John 14, talking about Jesus' own words. I go to prepare a place for you. Yeah. If I go, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you shall be also. And so here we sit, we're waiting for Jesus. Now tell us, why is Pentecost so important? Well, I'm opening my Bible here to Leviticus 23, which opens with the idea of the weekly Sabbath. Uh, this is the law. Leviticus lays out not only the festivals, but general behavior, legal, uh, legal uh, uh, situations that meet every aspect of, uh, of society. But here in Leviticus 23, the Lord speaks to Moses and he declares, six weeks shall work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. That's Leviticus 23.3. 3. He's talking about the weekly Sabbath. And starting in verse 4, he says, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. First of the seven Jewish festivals. Now, Christ is our Passover. That is actually stated in the New Testament. Paul goes into it in great depth and detail. Christ was crucified for us. He was the Lamb of God. Uh, the lamb to be sacrificed on Passover. The next feast is unleavened bread, uh, which is the very next day, the 15th day of the same month, the feast of unleavened bread uh, unto the Lord. Well, Jesus often lectured on the fact that He was the bread that came down from heaven. So 
First of all, He is our Passover. He is our unleavened bread. Uh, the next feast mentioned here in Leviticus 23 is first fruits. And the first fruits is uh, mentioned in verse 11 here, and he shall wave the sheaf, in Hebrew that's the omer, before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. Uh, the priest shall wave it. Now so, explain that because that's confusing to most people. How do you wave an omer? What is an omer? An omer is uh, a, a little less than a quart. It would be a clay pot that would hold a, a little less than our modern quart. And the omer is the first sheaf of the harvest. And it is brought, it is displayed by the high priest who holds the omer up on the day after the Sabbath, that would be Sunday. And this is first fruits. Christ is our first fruits. And we'll get into that. Paul writes about that. Christ is our first fruits. Now, the, the day of the Omer takes place at the beginning of a count, if you will, a countdown. And we, uh, we look a little further along in Leviticus 23, uh, verse 15, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought forth the sheaf, that is the Omer, of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. And that's seven weeks or 49 days. Uh, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath ye shall number 50 days. And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So you have, first of all, uh, you have the Passover. And then you have unleavened bread symbolizing Christ. And then you have first fruits. Christ was the first fruits because He was the very first one resurrected. So this omer that's held up by the priest represents the resurrected Christ. Then you start this countdown of 49 days followed by the 50th day. And by the way, the, the Greek word for 50 is Pentecosti, from which we get our English word Pentecost, which just simply means 50th or the 50th day. And on the 50th day the priest comes forth and blesses two loaves of leavened bread, which he holds up and he waves those before the congregation and recites a blessing. And the, the bread, the two loaves of bread are leavened, not unleavened. And they occur at the end of that 50 day count. And the 50th day, like the first day, occur on the day after the Sabbath, on a Sunday. Well, there you have a beautiful setting in the Old Testament for what happened much, much later on in the book of Acts. And so that's why I get excited when I study the feasts of Israel. Now, there's a couple of things. You know, Israel's society back then revolved around harvest, it revolved around agriculture. I mean, we don't have that today if we don't worry about whether we're going to have anything to eat. We go down to a fast food place or a restaurant, other people right. prepare our food for us. But back in the Old Testament, the harvest and the planting and all of this really relied on the blessing of God to bring a harvest so they actually had food to eat. And, and Indeed. And Pentecost, by the way, is the harvest festival. That's where the grain is brought in. And that's, in fact, that's the time that the fruit begins to be harvested. And if you think about it, midsummer is the time when you start harvesting the peaches, the plums, uh, the, the tree fruits, uh, even the grapes, things like that. And so the timing is, is beautifully done. Pentecost is the time of harvest. And the harvest is illustrated by Jesus in the book of Matthew when He comes and, and lectures on the flow of the seasons. He always mentions the harvest being the end of the age. He tells the disciples, and, and I'm quoting from, from Matthew, the harvest, He said, is the end of the age. And so now you say, oh, now you've got my attention. When we begin to talk about the end of the age. Well, there's a, there's a picture being formed here, yeah. if I understand right. I mean, people are wondering, why did God give the Israelites these feast days? What's the purpose of these feast days? What are they celebrating? I mean, what do they all signify? And it's a big picture, isn't it? It's a, it's a huge picture. And I want to go forward <clears throat> to uh, Acts uh, chapter Chapters 1 and 2, and just to review very quickly, uh, Acts chapter 1 uh, has 
the, the Lord, the resurrected Jesus, with the disciples, and he has been around. Now, this is the 40th day after his crucifixion in Acts chapter 1. And we're in the middle, if you will, of the counting of the Omer, and we have reached day 40 in Acts chapter 1. And then you have, as the Acts chapter 1 is concluded, you have the appointment of Matthias to take the place of Judas, so that there would be 12 disciples. And Acts chapter 1 ends on verse 26, and they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And then chapter 2 begins, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Well, when would the day of Pentecost be fully come? It would be after the count of 49 plus 1, the 50th day since Jesus had been uh, crucified, uh, had lain in the grave, and had been resurrected on first fruits, which begins that 49 day count plus 1. And now we're, we're in the 50th day. And in conforming with everything that the Jews do, uh, the apostles at this point had stayed up all night studying. This was Jewish tradition. Now a lot of people don't know this, but the Jews keep Pentecost by staying up all night on uh, the eve of the 6th of Sivan, and we'll talk about that. The 6th of Sivan is the date of Pentecost in the Jewish calendar. And they stay up all night and they study special scriptures which speak of the blessing of the Lord, the harvest, the blessing of the Lord uh, uh, upon the people if they follow His law. They, they have special scriptures laid out which are called readings for the night of Shavuot or Pentecost. By the way in Hebrew Shavuot is the word for weeks and Pentecost is called in the Jewish language weeks. Seven weeks plus one equals fifty. In the Greek language Pentecost. So the Jews stay up all night on the eve of this 50th day and they study this series of readings. But they have a belief which has been handed down from ages past. Nobody knows how far back it goes. And their belief is that at some time during the night while they're studying and praying the heavens will open for just a split second mm -hmm. and God will bless them in some way. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. In a moment. And so you have this wonderful picture. The Jews even have a name for this. They call it decorating the bride. <laughs> Can you believe that? You know, there are so many little hints in the Feast of Pentecost oh. that, that scream the word rapture at us. Oh, yes. Over and over. It's almost <laughs> like God designed this, almost like a tease. Like, here, I'm going to give you this, and this, and this, and this, and this. These are all parts of Jewish tradition. In fact, according to the rabbis, do you know why the Jews stay up all night? Because when God gave the law at Mount Sinai to Moses, they fell asleep waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. They couldn't even stay awake. And so to make up for it in history, they decided to stay up all night on Pentecost. Well, for whatever reason, they <laughs> stay up to this very day. Uh, faithful Jews read a, a special a series of readings for, for the night of Pentecost called Tikkun Le'il Shavuot, uh, which is readings for the night of the Feast of Weeks, which we call Pentecost. And so the disciples had stayed up all night and we read in Acts bride. chapter 2 verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, meaning that it's getting toward morning, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they began to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. Now Pentecost in those days was a pilgrimage festival, which means that, and, and by the way those there were three of them, uh, the one of course on Passover, one on Pentecost, and one on Shavu, uh, on, on Sukkot, or uh, that is the Feast of Tabernacles. So here is a pilgrimage festival. Jews from all over the Roman Empire were in Jerusalem. And guess what? You read this, uh, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Speaking every language. Speaking every language. And we go through a long list of the languages down here, and they all heard the disciples in their own language. Well, 
Uh, we could go into that, but our purpose today is not to talk about the phenomenon of Pentecost so much as the typology or the prophetic typology of Pentecost, which is just very rich. For example, what happens after Christians are raptured? What's the next step after the rapture of the church? We arrive in heaven in the moment of a twinkling of an eye. What happens next? In the Jewish festival calendar, there is an interval between Pentecost and Rosh Hashanah. And it's called the dark time, which is fascinating because that too is prophetic. Uh, it, it, if, as we think may be true, the Pentecost marks the catching away of the church, that would be followed by a dark time. And but before that dark over, time, before that dark time, something else happens. The fruit of the trees is judged. Yeah, the fruit of the trees is judged. In fact, Pentecost is called the judgment of the fruit of trees. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly the situation. When we go to heaven, all of us must appear, pre, uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ to judge the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. Paul wrote that in, in uh, Corinthians. So I see what you're driving at. Yeah, but. and by the way, Pentecost is on May 24th this year. It is. Sivan 6 and 7 which this year uh, come on May 24th and 25th. Sunday. And this is because the, the method of calculating Pentecost, going way back into the recorded, unrecorded mists of time, uh, Pentecost is impossible to calculate precisely so that its precise coming cannot be figured. No man knows the day or the hour, is that yeah, what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> And Yet so, another hint. And so the Jews say that their, their thought is, well, we'll celebrate it on two days, and in that way we'll be sure and hit it. And, and it's a symbolic idea that Pentecost is an incalculable uh, holiday. But yet there's a lot of people who believe that Rosh Hashanah potentially could be the date of the rapture, not Pentecost. And they always right. come back to the trumpet. You have a totally different take on the trumpet of Pentecost, don't you? Yeah, I do. The, 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 uh, and we'll get into that in just a second, except to say that the trumpet blast on Rosh Hashanah is, is specifically designed to strike fear into the heart of the listener. It's a time of fear and, and self-judgment. It marks the beginning of a 10-day period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and it, it is thought by the Jews to be the most uh, fear inciting aspect of the entire Jewish calendar. And there are 100 blasts of the shofar, all of them denoting judgment. Pentecost, on the other hand, does not denote judgment. It, it denotes uh, the coming of something new and different. Let me uh, illustrate. I want to go back to the story of the flood. And I'm looking at Genesis chapter 8 and 9. And we see that uh, when the ark comes to rest, in Genesis 8, 14, the second month on the seventh and twentieth day of the month was the earth dried and God spoke unto Noah. Well, that second month, the seventh and twentieth day of the month is ER 27. It's precisely one week before the sixth of Sivan, which would, and of course, the, during the days of Noah, there was no such thing. As, uh, as Pentecost or weeks because the law had not been given yet. And yet when you read Genesis chapter 9, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fr fruitful and multiply, replen replenish the earth. It was a week later. So it coincides with what would later become Pentecost. The Noahic covenant which God gave to Noah then came on Pentecost. And then quickly I turn over here to uh, Exodus 19. And it came to pass, this is Exodus 19.16, on the third day in the morning that there were thunders, lightnings, a thick cloud upon the mountain, the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And this is the third of Sivan, by the way, which is three days before what we now call Pentecost. The voice of the trumpet, you said. Moses, in the voice of the trumpet, Moses goes up. And by the way, it was not a mechanical trumpet. It was the voice of God on the mountaintop. And so Moses goes up 
Three days later, he receives the law on what? The 6th of Sivan. What a coincidence. <laughs> so Noah, Noah received the Noahic covenant on the 6th of Sivan. Moses received the law on the 6th of Sivan. You turn over here to Acts, and guess what? Acts chapter 2, the, the disciples received the Holy Spirit on... The it sixth, can't possibly be true. The 6th of Sivan. I mean, the Bible is full of types and symbols and shadows and yeah. patterns, and we see this over <clears throat> and over again. It's miraculous. It's absolutely astounding. And, and I, I opened my Bible to Ruth, the book of Ruth. Ruth married Boaz. Ruth is a Gentile bride. Boaz is a, uh, a type of Christ. And at midnight, it came to pass at midnight uh, that the man was afraid, or that he startled. He turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. That woman was Ruth. The man was Boaz, a type of Christ. Ruth, a type of the Gentile bride. And he says, who are you? And, he sa and she says, I'm Ruth. Long story short, they were betrothed and they were married. And, and the they had a son. And they had a son, by the way, <laughs> whose name was Obed. Obed. And he was the grand, great grandfather of King David. And out of that union, which by the way took place on the 6th of Sivan, <laughs> came King David. A Gentile bride became part of the messianic lineage of Jesus. Another little tidbit. <laughs> another little tidbit. David, King David lived to be 70 years old. He was born on the 6th of Sivan. He died precisely 70 years later on the 6th of Sivan. Pentecost. Are we talking coincidence Should we here? talk about Enoch? Do we dare? <laughs> no date is given for Enoch, but... Uh, Rabbinic something. tradition says that Enoch was, was born and raptured on Pentecost. We don't know we don't if know. that's true or not. But it has to be true. It, it, how much does it take before the, the image finally settles into your thinking? God holds the 6th of Sivan to be a very special date. And we call it Pentecost. It's the day, it's the, it's the birthday of, of the church. And I just want to read something that Paul wrote <clears throat> about the resurrections. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Now, do you remember Christ was resurrected on first fruits, and that count of the omer started. One, two, three, all the way up to fifty. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. And so there is a countdown that's written in Scripture. That, and, and fifty, by the way, is a, a multiple of five, the number of grace. So we could spend a lot of time, we don't have the time today to talk about the numerical aspects of the number 50 in Scripture. But let me just say this, grace expresses itself in a way that if you study can be easily discerned. And I get excited every year about this time, this year May 24th, 25th, when Pentecost rolls around and I think about that ancient Jewish tradition, for a brief moment the heavens may open up. And that's, by the way, what I'm waiting for. How about you? I get a new calendar every year, and the only date I circle on the calendar is Pentecost and my, my wife's birthday. You know, Bob, I, I have a, a book here called Christ in the Feast of Pentecost by David Brickner and, and Rich Robinson. On the back, uh, I, I want to read this little note. We're all eagerly... Uh, or that is, let me read it again. I, I, I blew it. We've all eagerly uh, counted the days to a special occasion. And Pentecost, Shavuot, is the only holiday for which God commanded a countdown. Well, we've, we've reviewed that, that countdown to 50. And in a way, we're all counting down right now. Uh, all of us are, are awaiting that, that day when we hear the shout and uh, the heavens open for a brief instant. He comes down, we go up, we meet in the air. Uh, what a day. What can you say? Uh, this whole book I talked about earlier, Rest, talks about eternity and talks about what we're all striving for, what we're all hoping for. One day we're going to hear the trumpet and the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be in heaven, but more importantly, we're going to be with Jesus.